Hi guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. There are a lot of ridiculous misconceptions out there about boa constrictors, and I see these misconceptions being perpetuated on an almost daily basis on social media, even by people who claim to know about snakes. Today I wanted to dispel some of these common boa constrictor misconceptions that I find so ridiculous and annoying. If you're new to the channel, this is the place for information about all aspects of keeping and breeding boa constrictors. So be sure to subscribe if you want to learn all about these amazing animals. The first ridiculous boa misconception is that boa constrictors are giant snakes. And I see this everywhere. Most of the write-ups online about boa constrictors, they make claims like the average size is 10 feet long and they can get up to 18 feet long. And so they just generally greatly over exaggerate the size of these animals. The truth is the actual average size for most boa constrictors as adults is somewhere in the six to nine foot range. And when we're talking about dwarf boas like this qual key, these animals are typically in the four to six foot range. This is an adult male. He's about four feet long and he's not gonna get any bigger than this. There is a publication of a uh, size of 18 feet, which is supposedly the record for boa constrictors. And this is, dates back to the mid 20th century of an animal that was captured in uh, Trinidad. But it's been shown that this was not a boa constrictor, but it was a case of a misidentified anaconda. And the actual true record for boa is probably somewhere in the 13 foot range or so for a true red tailed boa. And these animals are extremely rare. This is like a human that's eight feet long or eight feet tall rather, not long. Humans can get that tall, but it's literally less than one in a, in a probably one in a billion. So boa constrictors are not giant snakes, but they're in the medium to large size range. The next misconception is that boa constrictors are dangerous and often result in human fatalities. And this is completely untrue. In fact, I haven't seen a single well-documented case of a boa constrictor related fatality. And if you do, if you know of one, please let me know. Please post below in the comments or message me. I would love to hear if you have a documented case. I found one report on the internet of a man in Nebraska in 2010 who supposedly was killed by his pet boa constrictor. And all it says is the animal was nine feet long and 25 pounds. They don't give any other information other than that. And people have been killed by pythons. Every few years you hear about a fatality due to a python. But often people misidentify boas and pythons. They think they're basically the same thing. I've even seen National Geographic documentaries where they show a picture of a python when they're talking about boas and vice versa, which drives me up the wall. Um, but boas are really not dangerous animals. If you look at the actual fatalities, you're much more likely to be killed by a pet dog or a farm animal or even a bee string. A related misconception is that boas are aggressive and bite a lot. And I recently did an episode about boa bites. I don't want to give people the wrong impression. Boas, of course, can and do bite. But the actual truth is the vast majority of boas are not aggressive and it's relatively easy to avoid getting bitten even if you have an aggressive boa. So if you're thinking about a pet boa but you're concerned about being bitten, I would say this is a very minor concern and it shouldn't stop you from getting the boa that you've always wanted. The next two misconceptions are around feeding your boa. And the first is about how often you should feed your boa. And this is a major subject of debate. And if you look at a lot of the older literature, and by older I mean books from the 90s and early 2000s, they indicate in general you should feed a boa once a week. And for most boas, this is going to be too much. It's going to result in an obese boa that's going to be unhealthy with a greatly shortened lifespan. I've done quite a number of videos about the proper feeding regimens for boas, so you know, check one of those out if you want more information. What I've seen is a reaction to this guideline that you should feed once a week is that people are erring on the extreme low side of what should be fed. And I've even seen people that claim they only feed baby boas once every four to six weeks, something like that, because they don't want to feed it too much. And that's ridiculous also because you're just starving your boa and if it's even surviving you're going to greatly stunt its growth. 
Again, I've gotten into a lot of detail about this topic, but I'll say that most boas should eat somewhere between every 10 days and every four weeks, depending on their age and their body condition. A related misconception is that boas need to eat live food and that if you don't provide them with live food, they're gonna be missing out on an important behavior of constricting and it's not gonna be as healthy. And the truth is this is not true at all. The vast majority of boas have no problem at all eating frozen thawed uh, rodents. They don't need any kind of live food. Some of them, at first, you might need to kind of jiggle the, the uh, rodent to make it look alive, but the vast majority of established boas you don't need to pretend that the, boat, the rodent is alive. Unfortunately, there are a small number of exceptions to this rule. For example, this is a three-year-old Honduran firebelly boa, and this female is just insistent upon eating a live mouse. Uh, you know, she just, for whatever reason, is kind of picky, and you know, I kind of spoil her by giving her the live mouse on, you know, on a regular basis. Hopefully I can wean her off before she reaches adulthood. Um, but you know, out of all the hundreds of snakes I've worked with, or hundreds of boas, there's only a handful that have insisted upon eating live rodents. And the vast, vast majority have no problem taking freeze thought. And it's also just as healthy as the live rodents, provided that the food is fresh and it's raised on a balanced diet. The next two misconceptions are about your boa's enclosure. And the first is that you need to duplicate your boa's natural habitat, either the Amazon rainforest or you know, wherever it lives in the wild, in order for it to be happy and healthy. And this is completely untrue. This would be like claiming that you need to recreate the subarctic tundra habitat of the wolf in order for your dog to be happy, because a dog is basically just a domesticated wolf. The truth is that most morph boas are just as domesticated in captivity at this point as many domestic animals like cats, rodents, and chickens. The other thing to consider is that even non-domestic wild snakes will often seek human habitants and specifically trash dumps because the trash dumps have a lot of hiding places and habitat and they attract rodents, which are a food source. So snake hunters in the wild will often go to trash dumps because they can find snakes under the cardboard and the uh, corrugated aluminum, as well as pieces of wood, things like that. So the snakes don't care. They just want a warm hiding place that has a lot of food nearby. So as long as you're providing the right environmental te uh, conditions, the temperature, the humidity, the space, and importantly, the hiding places for your boa to feel comfortable, your boa is gonna be completely fine and healthy in a cage that doesn't look at all like its natural habitat. So some people do like creating naturalistic vivariums, and they are beautiful to look at, and you know, I really enjoy seeing these things at zoos. You know, if I had the time, I probably would set one up myself. So if you wanna do that, that's great, that's fine. Your, your boa will love it and enjoy it, and you'll, as the pet owner, will love looking at your boa in there. But it's really not necessary for his or her health and well-being. One additional misconception about cages, which I thought no one believed anymore, but I actually saw somebody claiming this the other day, is that your boa will only grow to its enclosure size. So if you keep it in a cage, it's only two feet long, it's not gonna grow more than two or three feet. And this, of course, is completely untrue. Your boa is gonna continue to grow as long as you're feeding it, and it's gonna reach its adult size regardless of the size of the enclosure. So if you want a smaller boa that's not gonna need a very large enclosure, you should seek out one of the dwarf or semi-dwarf forms of boa, like the Tarahumara or Kralki uh, dwarf boa. One more really ridiculous misconception about your boa's enclosure is that boas are social and they need a cage mate in order to be happy. They need another snake or boa to keep them company. And this again is really ridiculous and I didn't think people really believed this, but I see this on a pretty regular basis. And it's interesting because the reaction on the boa boards, if anyone asks about cohabitation, it's almost asking like a taboo subject and people just go ballistic and they shred the person. And you know, I don't really like that either, which is you know one of the reasons I left Facebook and I set up this channel. So, you know, hopefully a, a less hostile place to give boa information. So what I will say is that 
for the vast, vast majority of people, it does not make sense to keep more than one snake in each enclosure and your boa is going to be the most healthy and happy that way. Boas aren't social, they don't have connections to other boas. They really only interact in the wild when it comes to, ooh, to mate. She didn't like that. Um, so your boa doesn't need a cage mate. That being said, it's not 100% wrong to cohabitate boas. Obviously we need to put them in the same cage in order to have them breed. And with my breeding pairs, I keep them together typically four to six months out of the year. You know, I've never had any issues with this. You know, the, it's always worked out fine and I've never had a boa injure another boa or anything bad happening. And I've even heard about cohabitation 100% of the time as a breeding strategy. So what I will say to the people who jump all over the people who ask about cohabitating boas, it's not 100% wrong 100% of the time, just not a good idea for the vast majority of people and situations. The next boa misconception is regarding locality boas. And the misconception is that you can tell a boa's locality solely based on its looks and physical characteristics. And this is not true almost all the time. So one example is with Guiana and Suriname uh, true red-tailed boas. There's really no way to differentiate these animals based on physical characteristics. So unless you know where the animal's uh, ancestors originated and there's been a pedigree of its lineage, you can't really claim that your animal is from Guiana or Suriname, just that it's consistent with one of those or consistent with a Guiana shield boa constrictor from Northern South America. So this is, happens to be a Suriname boa, but if I didn't tell you that, you could have really no way of telling them apart. I know that people claim that there are certain characteristics which supposedly can differentiate Guiana from Suriname. Like the Guianas tend to have more blocky saddles and more of a purpley gray coloration, while the Suriname tend to have thinner saddles, more of a pinkish, brownish, light tan coloration. But the truth is, that these are probably uh, phenotypes which have been selected for in captivity. In addition, in the past, the exporters would typically take animals from both Suriname and Guiana and just separate them based on what they thought a Guiana or Suriname boa should look like. So there's really no way of telling for sure. And scientifically, biologically, they're this really the same thing. So. A related misconception has to do with saddle shapes in true red tail boas. And I see this all the time. There's this claim that if it doesn't have the peak saddles like this animal, it's not a true red tail boa. So you can see the peak saddles on this animal. They have these projections that point towards the tail and towards the front of the boa. And a lot of true red tail boas do have these peak saddles. However, not all of them do. And just because they don't doesn't mean that it's not a true red tail boa. Conversely, a lot of non red tail boas do have some peaking in the saddles, including boas like uh, Amaralli and some of the boa imperator, the Colombian uh, imperator boas, but they're not true red tail boas. They're not boa constrictor constrictor. This is an example of a true red tail boa, boa constrictor constrictor, and you can see it does not have the peak saddles. It has these nice round saddles. And this animal not only is a Suriname true red tail boa, but it's a full sibling and litter mate to the male I just showed you. So even from the same two parents, you can get a range of phenotypes in the offspring as far as the saddle shape. And both peaked and non-peaked saddles are present in true red tail boas. So the final misconception I wanted to discuss, I hear a lot, and it's that boa breeding is a very lucrative and glamorous pastime or career. You know, and the truth is, as much as I love it, it's really not glamorous nor uh, very money-making. In fact, I did a episode entitled Making Money Breeding Boas, so check that one out if you're interested in the details. But as the old adage goes, what is the best way to make a small fortune breeding boas? You start with a large fortune. And the truth is the vast majority of people who try to do this to make money are gonna end up not making any money. He's trying to get up there. 
Maybe something's in the air today and the snakes are a little restless. But the vast majority of people don't make up, uh, don't end up making any money breeding boas. And those who do generally are at it for a very long time and they don't give up. And of course, as far as the glamour, we see all these beautiful pictures of these baby boa litters and everyone loves to fantasize about all the baby boas that they're going to have. But that's, you know, maybe 1% of the time. I'd say like 95% of the time is just the hard work of cleaning cages and scooping poop and feeding snakes and doing all the day-to-day -day activities to keep a boa breeding operation running. You know, which I love, don't get me wrong, but it's certainly not glamorous. So that was some common and annoying and ridiculous misconceptions about boa constrictors. I hope this was helpful. As always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.